Hello, everyone. Oh. <laughs> oh, aren't you lovely? Thank you so much. What a great crowd, my goodness. What an honor to be here at the eighth annual Women in the World Summit. Wow, okay. <laughs> Shall I dance for you? Okay. It is truly amazing for me to look into the crowd and see so many women looking back at me, almost as many as at a full frontal staff meeting. Okay, um, it's a good thing there are some young people here, or Hillary would think this was her 58th Wellesley College reunion. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised that Secretary Clinton was available to speak tonight. I assumed by now Hermione would have returned to her rightful home at Hogwarts, where she's rumored to be the new Defense Against the Dark Arts professor. <laughs> at least we're all hoping. Um, when I was first asked to introduce Hillary Clinton, I laced up my hiking boots, made a batch of gorp, and Googled Westchester. Off to the woods we go. So you can imagine my relief when I was told I only had to come to Lincoln Center in a monsoon. Um, <laughs> Hillary, if you are listening to me right now, I really hope you watched our show last night. We gave you so many compliments. <laughs> please, please, please come on our show one day. No pressure, just everybody here really wants it. Um, <laughs> The last person to introduce Hillary at this conference was Meryl Streep. So to all of you here today, I'd just like to say, I'm sorry I am not Meryl Streep. <laughs> Believe me. Um, it's actually hard to know what to say today. I should be lauding Hillary for making time to be here despite her busy schedule as president. I should be talking, <laughs> yes. I should be talking about how she didn't just shake Angela Merkel's hand, but hugged her. Instead, Mr. Trump is nearing his 100th day in office. I assume he'll mark it the same way all school children do, by gluing 100 pieces of macaroni to a health care bill. <laughs> there are rumors that Hillary may consider a mayoral bid in New York City. Uh, yes. I know. I know she would relish the opportunity to tell President Trump that this great city will not spend millions of dollars on an apartment for the First Lady. Or she could at least demand that if we do pay for it, Bill would have to live there as well. Okay. <laughs> what comes next is something for Hillary to decide. It's easy to see the appeal of spending your days in the woods listening to fight song on repeat. But, of course, Secretary Clinton is ready for something new. That's so rotten of her. There are only so many times she can play and lose the Hamilton lottery before looking for a new job. Besides, what else would she do with her time? Play golf? It's not like she's the sitting president. Um, so, I'm only gonna say this once though you deserve to hear it a hundred times. It should have been you. And yes. You would have made mistakes and you would have been attacked for doing things that now seem so inconsequential. I mean, for God's sake, I was supposed to talk about you on my show for the next four years. And now I'm saddled with that, pant that pint of flat orange Fanta who gives me more material than I would ever want. I thought and I feared that you being elected would unleash a wave of misogyny in the US, but we've seen that that happened anyway. Which is why we can't allow ourselves to dwell on the fact that I had a celebratory blue sequin custom suit made for my post-election show and I could barely wear it. We may not know what the future will hold, but I'm hopeful that there is one. Um, <laughs> and I do believe it exists in the young women and men who live in this new unexpected reality, who see your legacy, Hillary, and work to build upon it. 
specifically the 3,000 women in this room today who I will most certainly sync up with if I stand here much longer. Of course, you know, there could also... I, let's face it. There could also be a future for you in basic cable if you're interested in any sort of development deal. You'll see that venting on TV once a week for 21 minutes is actually quite cathartic. You'll feel right at home. The haters will still call you shrill. Though I know that your work is not yet done, your mark has already been made, and you inspire people in so many different ways. Your work and its legacy, it's a beautiful thing to share with my daughters, to show them that the passions that they have when they're young can become not just a career, but can lead to a lifetime of fulfillment and meaning. I know you don't just mean that to me. Today, Hillary will be interviewed by failing New York Times journalist Nicholas Kristof. <laughs> Can you believe she had to take five months off of campaigning just to prep for this interview? That's a lot of missed trips to Pennsylvania and Michigan. Every year, Kristof holds a win a trip with Nick Kristof contest, where he chooses someone to accompany him on a reporting trip around the globe. I saw Hillary give him her application backstage. The essay portion merely said, get me out of here. But Nick, you should really consider her. She's been working on her hiking and her outdoor skills. In any event, it is an honor to be here with both of them tonight. And I look forward to hearing what Hillary can say when the person she's sharing the stage with isn't constantly shouting wrong. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you are not allowed to cry when she talks. That is not why she is here today. Please welcome to the stage, Hillary Rodham, Beyonce Clinton. Thank you. Yay. That was super. Thank you so much. Thank you all. <laughs> well, I am, right? I'm yeah, happy, happy to be here. Uh, well, we kind of feel we should offer you condolences, but maybe you should offer us condolences. Yes, I, I have thought a lot about that. And uh, there are certainly enough condolences to go around. <laughs> I hope we uh, move on to being able to see some positive uh, developments uh, in our, our country, but uh, you know, that's gonna take some time, apparently. So, uh, um, I asked my social media followers you know, what to ask you, and there were a lot of policy questions, but truly, one of the most common was, so how is Secretary Clinton doing? So how are you doing? You know what, I, I am doing pretty well, all things considered. Uh, you know, the aftermath of the election was so devastating and everything that has kind of come to light in the days and weeks since have been um, also troubling. Uh, so I just had to make up my mind that yes, I was going to get out of bed and yes, I was going to go for a lot of long walks uh, in the woods and I was going to see my grandchildren a lot and spend time with my family and my friends who have rallied around me in a, an amazing way. We've had lots of fun, adventures, uh, long nights talking and laughing. And so I'm okay, I will put it this way. As a person, I'm okay. As an American, I'm pretty worried. Um, so I think I'll take off my person hat and put on my citizen hat and you know, there's a lot to be concerned about. And when you saw Jim Comey say that he had been investigating the Trump team's Russia ties since July, but that it had been inappropriate to disclose this because he shouldn't disclose an ongoing investigation. So what did you throw at the TV? <laughs> you 
Yes, that was one of the high points of the, <laughs> the last weeks. Look, I, I, am, I am deeply concerned about uh, what went on with Russia, and I think it's important that we all work together, regardless of party or partisanship or anything else. We start acting like patriotic Americans because a foreign power meddled with our election and did so in a way that we are learning more about every single day. And the people who are looking into it, some of my former colleagues in the Senate, like uh, Senator Mark Warner from Virginia, who's on the Intelligence uh, Committee, you know, has said that the Russian hacking should give chills to anybody who cares about democracy. And, you know, John McCain from the other side of the aisle, he said he's never been so worried about our country in his lifetime. And that's a lifetime that included World War II and Vietnam and being a prisoner of war. So I think that there does seem to be uh, a lot of uh, concern, uh, which I share, because I think what was done to us uh, was a uh, an act of aggression, and it was uh, carried out by a foreign power under the control of someone who has a uh, deep desire to dominate uh, Europe and to uh, send us into a tailspin. Uh, and I think what Putin wanted to do is to sow distrust and confusion as well as influence our election. So as an American, I am you know, hoping that uh, whether it's the Congress or the FBI or outside journalists or whoever the combination of forces might be that we find out a whole lot more. I personally favor an independent nonpartisan investigation that uh, I think is called for. And do you think that there was collusion between the Trump campaign and the Kremlin? I think that is what this investigation should look at. I'm hopeful that uh, the Congress will pull together and realize that because of the success that uh, the Kremlin feels that it had, they're not going to go away. So whatever party you are, whatever business you run, whatever kinds of concerns you have, if we don't take action together to hold whoever was involved accountable, they will be back time and time again. And, um, you know, look, from my perspective, I know Putin. I actually have sat with him as I'm sitting with you, Nick. And, you know, this is somebody who uh, plays the long game. He plays three-dimensional chess. He's always trying to figure out how to advantage himself, his oligarchic uh, uh, companions, and his country uh, in that order. And so he is very much focused on um, destabilizing Europe, NATO, the United States, uh, democracies, real democracies. Uh, and, you know, people have asked me, well, you know, why do you think he did that to you? And, you know, I don't, I don't think it's too complicated. I think he had his desire to destabilize us and others. And, you know, he's not exactly uh, fond of strong women. Uh, so you add that together and that's pretty much what it, uh, what it means. Although he it, did shake hands with me. <laughs> uh, and one looks at Russia today, and its economy is facing some real difficulties. There have been uh, protests in, I think, 99 cities around the country. So as you look at Putin's Russia, is there some instability there? And may we in turn see democracy, real democracy, return to Russia? Well, I, I wouldn't pretend to be an expert on it. I can only tell you my observations, which um, 
I came to over my time in public life, uh, both in the 90s as well as you know, a senator and secretary of state, I think you know, Russia has every asset that any country could hope for to build a modern economy that will provide broad-based prosperity across that massive country and give opportunities for people to pursue their own dreams as however they define them. And instead, what we've seen is a consolidation of power and a real commitment to shutting the door on freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, freedom of thought. And that is to Russia's detriment. So I know that in the recent uh, protests that we have seen, and of course part of why Putin fell out with me was because as Secretary of State, I did say that uh, the parliamentary elections leading up to his return as president uh, were uh, not fair, uh, were uh, marred by all kinds of uh, illegitimate uh, interference. And then there was an outpouring. People went to the streets and Putin said I'd caused it, which was absurd. It was the unexpressed hope of millions of Russians of all ages uh, that they could have a normal democracy, that they could you know, be able to start a business without worrying that they might catch somebody's eye who would come in and rip it out from under them, that they could speak out and be you know, as free as possible. Now, is that something that can happen in the you know, near term? I don't know, but I do know this. Because Putin has chosen a different path for Russia's future, he is worried by any comparison. That's really, in large measure, what Ukraine was about. Ukraine was moving toward the EU. They wanted to, as many young Ukrainians told me, uh, to be part of a positive future, to feel like they had all kinds of options. And uh, you know that was displeasing to Putin. And he views the EU, he views NATO as direct threats to his power, uh, which he uh, equates with Russia's power. And in the conversations that I had with him and high-ranking uh, Russian officials, I, I would just be dumbfounded. I would say, you lose smart, really creative people every single day. They leave for Paris, Berlin, London, you know, Toronto, New York, Silicon Valley. You have the most extraordinary potential. Why don't you let that flourish? And there were never any good answers. And I want the Russian people to know that, you know, we're in their corner. We would love for them to have the same opportunities that we want for our own people. Uh, and we hope that someday that will be possible. This is a women's empowerment conference, so I have to ask, you know, fundamentally, a man who bragged about sexual assault won the election and won 53% of the white women's vote. How is it that in the 21st century, and what does it say about the challenges that one faces in women's empowerment, that in effect misogyny won with a lot of women voter voters? Well, I am currently writing a book where I spend, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I spend a lot of time wrestling with this. As you might guess, I've thought about it more than once. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, I don't know that there is one answer. Let, let, let's be clear. I think there, you know, in any campaign, there's so many different cross currents and events, and some have greater impact than others. Um, but it is fair to say, as you just did, Nick, that certainly misogyny played a role. I mean, that just has to be admitted. And why and what the underlying reasons were is what I'm trying to parse out myself. I, I would just say this. Um, there, there is a, a constant struggle, and not just women, women and men, in 
a time of rapid change, like the one we are living through, um, between uh, something that is different, that may hold out even possible positive uh, consequences, and something that is familiar, and something that really is first and foremost about security of what you have right now. And I think in this election, there was a very real uh, struggle between uh, what is viewed as change that is welcomed and exciting to so many Americans and change which is worrisome and threatening to so many others. And you layer on the first woman president over that and I think some people, women included, had real problems. Now, it's fair to say that, you know, President Obama, my husband, you know, they also f really struggled for white votes for as many as they could get. Um, so we have to do a better job in speaking to and with people who uh, are on the downside of the change uh, equation and wondering what do we have to offer and why should they uh, vote for us as opposed to, well, I don't agree with him, not sure I you know, really approve of him, but he looks like somebody who's been a president before. So why do I want to add more change or more you know, potential uh, uh, anxiety to my life? You know, we're just going to go and hope he does a little bit of what he says. And I think that's where a lot of people are. On this theme of, of misogyny in, in elections, one of the most common questions that I got when I asked followers was from a, a, an enormous number of young women who frankly were galvanized by your loss in a way that they had not been galvanized by your campaign. And they want to go out right. and change the world. Right. In many cases by public service. But they're anxious about the nastiness mm. of being in public life, especially for women, and in some cases I think they're concerned about uh, the research that some social scientists have pointed to that women can be perceived as either likable or as competent leaders, but not as both. Yes, well that, that is part of what I meant earlier about the change, and, and let me just address that because I'm gonna spend a lot of my time encouraging young people, particularly young women, uh, to go into politics, to go into public service, uh, because I believe... <clears throat> I believe that not only is it a, a worthy and very satisfying uh, way to uh, contribute, make a living, uh, learn more, uh, but we really need you. And we need uh, more young people and we particularly need more young women. So I'm going to work with some of the organizations that are springing up. I'm going to work with those that have been around for a while to see how I can, um, you know, reach out, recruit, help train, uh, mentor, advise um, people to do this. However, having said that, probably one of the first things I would say to them is I would say to this uh, great conference, yeah, be ready. It, it is not a new phenomenon but it feels new and painful every time it happens to you. And so, one of my, you know, one of my favorite Americans, Eleanor Roosevelt, said, good grief, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, 70 years ago now, uh, more than that, that every woman who enters the public arena needs to grow skin as thick as the hide of a rhinoceros. And boy, do I relate to that. Um, <laughs> because, the research you just referred to, Nick, and Sheryl Sandberg wrote about this in her last book, Lean In, but many, many academics have written about it. And it's a pretty simple but unfortunate uh, phenomenon. With men, success and ambition are correlated with likability. So the more successful a man is, uh, the more likable he becomes. With a woman, guess what? It's the exact opposite. So the more successful and therefore ambitious a woman is, the less likable she becomes. 
That's the inverse correlation that lies at the heart of a lot of the uh, attacks and the misogyny, and it's unconscious. It's not like people, you know, say to themselves, well, you know, she's ambitious, she's successful, therefore I don't like her anymore. But the way our politics is structured and high-level public positions, that seems to be sort of baked into uh, the reality. So when I think about, uh, I, left the, I left the State Department as Secretary of State, I had like a 64, 65% approval rating. People thought I had really done a good job, which I was, you know, very touched by. And <laughs> and it was a job that I was asked to do by a man, President Obama, right? So I did it to the best of my ability and came out and some people said at the time, the most popular public official or high-profile public person in politics in the country. Well, what happened? <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, by the time they finished with me, I was Typhoid Mary. <clears throat> and poor Mary, I mean, she didn't deserve it either when you go back and look at the history. So... <laughs> So what happened? Well, I said, you know, I think I could be a really good president for our country at this point in our history, and I think I will run for president. And so from that moment, all of a sudden, from that high point of being the Secretary of State of the United States of America, I became a candidate seeking the highest office in the land and asking people to support me, and even people who had supported me in the media during my time as Secretary of State or even as Senator, you know, all of a sudden it's like, who is she, what does she want? You know, I always feel like I'm, you know, in waiting for Godot. I mean, it, <laughs> it, it, I, I've been around and some people say too long and other people say, well, we don't know her. I mean, I have a pretty long record of who I am and what I stand for and what I've done. But it really did verify, unfortunately, that research. So I guess the final thing is I want you to be involved. I am thrilled by all the activity that's going on, recruiting young people to run, showing up at town halls, making tens of thousands of phone calls that helped derail that terrible health care bill that the House Republicans were working on. So, but toughen up your skin. Take criticism seriously, but not personally. In other words, look, I am not perfect. Everybody knows that by now. So I am always open to people saying, well, you should have done that. Or you could. Sometimes I don't quite know how to fix what they're concerned about, but I, I try. Um, and so I take it seriously, but I don't any longer, and, for have, and haven't for a long time, take it personally. Because part of the, part of the attacks, the personal attacks, part of the bullying, part of the name calling that has certainly become much more pervasive because of the internet, is to crush your spirit, to make you feel inadequate, to make you doubt yourself. And I just refused to do that, and that infuriated them even more. <laughs> I believe that your staff conducted some autopsies of the election, and I'm looking for lessons learned, and in particular, I mean, do you, I, to what extent do you assign blame to uh, Bernie Sanders, to the media for focusing on emails? How much time to, do we have? <laughs> <laughs> to uh, Jim Co to President Obama yeah. for not no, raising not the issue of the of the Russia ties more, or to yourself? Well, you'll have to interview me after my book comes out, because, okay. seriously, 
This, this is a very fair question. And we have spent a lot of time, we, the proverbial, you know, multitudinous we, both people who worked on the campaign, people who were interested, observers and others, trying to sort of piece it all together. And uh, there, are, there are lots of contributing uh, factors, as there would be to any big enterprise like this. I mean, I basically started a billion dollar startup and, and ran it for 18 months. And so uh, there are things we certainly could have done better. There are things I certainly uh, could have done better. But I think uh, it is fair to say uh, that the outside intervention, the combination of uh, the Comey letter on October 28th, WikiLeaks, which played a much bigger role than I think many people understand yet, had uh, the determinative effect. Uh, Nate Silver, whom you know uh, well, and, and who was much more cautious throughout the election, saying, well, you know, this could happen, still thought I was going to win, and his autopsy was, but for the Comey letter on October 28th, I would have won. And so I think there are credible outside voices that I'm also trying to you know, bring together and analyze because for people who, who read my book who are interested in this, the nearly 66 million people who voted for me, uh, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I want to I wanna give as clear and as credible um, an explanation of these factors as I can. So I don't want to I don't want to short circuit it now, but certainly I and everybody around we've gone over and over and over and uh, uh, have learned some lessons. And I think that gets me back to sort of Russia in the sense that one of the lessons I think we've learned is that uh, since they were successful in influencing voters, it's different from you know the interference with the actual voting machines. And for a while, there was a confusion about that. A lot of people said, well, can you, really, can you prove that people interfere with the machines? That's something, put that to one side. Although, you know, there are people who um, pursue that, but put that to one side. It was really the weaponization of information, something that uh, Putin has used inside Russia, outside Russia, to great effect, uh, that we didn't and I'll say this for myself, I didn't fully understand how impactful that was. And so it created doubts in people. But then the Comey letter, coming as it did just 10 days before the election, really uh, raised serious questions in a lot of people uh, that uh, I think were obviously unfounded, but nevertheless happened. Uh, so I think there's a combination. So we've got to be really clear, Democrats, Republicans, whatever, what was done in that election, what was unprecedented, um, and be willing to say, we can't let that happen again. Look, I, I don't want any Republican candidate to be subjected to what I was subjected to. I don't want anybody running campaigns or the Republican Party uh, to have their... Uh, communication stolen, which is what it was. It was a theft. It was a more effective theft even than Watergate back in the day. So I want people to say, hey, we, we should have tough, really aggressive campaigning that goes with the territory, but we aren't going to let somebody sitting in the Kremlin with a thousand agents with bots and trolls and everybody else trying to mix up in our election. We've got to end that and we need to make sure that's a bipartisan American commitment. You've been through some uh, presidential transitions, 1993, 2009. Uh, so I'm curious what you make of President Trump's uh, first 100 days. And <laughs> in particular, one of the themes has been uh, the global gag rule, cutting off funds for the <coughs> UN Population Fund, an right. effort to, de to, to defund uh, Planned Parenthood. Right. And, you know, these extraordinary scenes of a bunch of men sitting around discussing women's health. Right. Um, what, what is your take on the administration so far, and in particular, what this means to women 
here and around the world? Well, first let me say that, and I, and I, I don't take any pleasure in seeing uh, the kind of chaotic functioning. Just a little bit of schadenfreude, just a little bit. No, and, and here's why, Nick. I mean, look, I mean, I thought I was going to win, and I had a really good transition operation going because I understood. You remember that point in the debate, one of the debates when uh, my opponent was uh, ridiculing me yet again for having prepared for the debate. And I said, yes, I did prepare for the de debate. And I'll tell you something else I prepared for, being president. Um, so I felt like... I, I, I felt like, you know, I would have... Look, it's, it's, it's the hardest job you can imagine. And um, I, I thought we would have been prepared. We would have been ready to move on a, a, a range of fronts. We had worked so hard on policies, even lining up, you know, personnel and the like. So, clearly, that wasn't well prepared for the incoming administration. And I think they are going through some very public uh, uh, growing pains. But here's what I don't understand. I don't understand the commitment to hurt so many people that this this administration, this White House, seems to be pursuing. You know, the, there, there are so many um, examples in just the first hundred days, the, you know, the, the ban on people coming into our country. And yes, it was aimed at originally seven, now six countries, but it really sent a chilling effect across the world, and not just to Muslims, to all kinds of people who are saying to themselves, wait a minute, what happened? Don't you still have Lady Liberty in the New York Harbor? Aren't we still the land of you know, opportunity and freedom? So it had a terrible impact. And then, of course, what they did or tried to do to the health care bill, which I did, I, I will confess to this, having listened to them talk about you know, repeal and replace for eight years or seven years now, and they had not a clue what that meant. They had no idea. I don't know that any of them had ever even read the bill, read the law, understood how it worked. It was so obvious. And, you know, health care is complicated, right? And, <laughs> and so they, they're like, they don't know what to do. And, yeah, I do admit that was somewhat uh, gratifying as they, you know, were going back and forth. And, um, But the, the targeting of women, which is what's going on, is absolutely uh, beyond any political agenda. It is, there's something else happening here. So the global gag rule, you know, that, that bounces back and forth between Republicans and Democrats. But the way they wrote it this time, not like Bush did, not like Reagan did, this time would be to remove all uh, aid if there is some kind of alleged breach because you provide you know, family planning services, but somebody says to a, a woman desperate to you know, you know, get an abortion because she's been told she'll die if she tries to bear another child, and so you try to help her, well, you then lose everything, everything, not just a little bit, but all of it. So then then, that, you follow up that with the UN Population Fund, which I have seen, and you've seen, because you've traveled extensively, the impact that those dollars have in saving women's and children's lives, in helping women have a better shot at a, a future because maybe she can get contraception and not, at, you know, had her first child at 14 and has had six or seven, now she's 27, and she's desperately trying to prevent another pregnancy, and she, she needs it. You know, this is not just the right and moral position for the United States to take. This is in our national security interests. The more we support women, the more we support democracy, the more we backhand terrorism and fundamentalism that can creep into countries, 
So women's issues are national security issues around the world. And then the final thing, which you, you mentioned, um, the things that come out of some of these men's mouths, like, <laughs> why do we have to cover maternity care? Oh, I don't know, maybe you were dropped by immaculate conception. Um, <laughs> who knows? I don't know. <laughs> and, and you know, and then you're right, I mean, the classic picture of all of the men sitting around the table, deciding how they were going to defund Planned Parenthood, end maternity care, end you know, uh, access to uh, insurance for family planning, for contraception. Um, looking at that picture, you know, it, it, you, you just think it's got to be uh, from a skit on Saturday Night Live. I mean, it can't possibly be true. My, my favorite GIF on the, uh, the internet uh, was showing the dog sitting around the table and the <laughs> caption was, now we will discuss feline health. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you about Syria. Um, oh, good, okay. The, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. This week we've seen these extraordinary images from Syria uh, children dying in a gas attack. And uh, your husband had said that his worst foreign policy mistake as president was not acting more in Rwanda. Um, in his defense, he only had 100 days. We've had a half dozen years in Syria as 300,000 people have been killed. Is that, was that President Obama's worst foreign policy mistake? And I know that uh, you were an advocate with De Petraeus of being more aggressive, but in retrospect, do you think that for you also, that was maybe your, your gravest foreign policy mistake as Secretary of State? Well, you're right. When I, I was Secretary of State, I, I teamed up with uh, Dave Petraeus, then Director of the CIA, Leon Panetta, then Secretary of Defense, to present a plan for us to uh, move um, more uh, aggressively to support uh, protesters, to try to uh, provide some backup in what was, I thought, uh, likely to turn out to be a, a very one-sided uh, battle. This was before ISIS really came to uh, public awareness with their uh, plan for a caliphate and their setting up uh, headquarters in Raqqa and I, I believed then, I've said this repeatedly, that I thought uh, we should have done more at that point. Now, I'm the first to say that these are, you know, these are not easy decisions. That's why you want to get the best information you can from the best advisors you can and to really drill down into uh, this, uh, whatever the situation is. I then, you know, I left the government and I then did you know, did promote a no-fly zone. And I still believe we should have done a no-fly zone. I think we should have uh, been more willing to confront Assad, because remember, the Russians didn't get in at first. Uh, and the Iranian help was pretty much on the ground with the so-called, uh, you know, Revolutionary Guard, Quds Force. And they were, you know, enlisting Hezbollah uh, units to fight on the ground, because there was a real fight going on. Um, but Assad had an air force, and that air force is the cause of most of the civilian deaths, as we have seen over the years and as we saw again uh, in the last few days. And I really believe that we should have and still should um, take out his airfields and prevent him from being able to use them to bomb innocent people and drop sarin gas on them. So, you know, I, I wish, I, I, you know, obviously, I, I wish that uh, the, the international community writ large had been able to uh, rein this in, 
Uh, I spent a lot of time with the Russians, uh, with uh, the uh, Arab states, the Gulf states, and I actually had worked out an agreement for a transition in June of 2012 in Geneva, and we had hammered it out all day long. Um, the Russian foreign minister, Lavrov, actually agreed to it. Um, and it was calling for a technocratic government and, in effect, for the easing out of Assad. And I know that he had, he left our meeting, I know he went to his embassy, I know that he asked, you know, for guidance, and he came back and agreed. So it lasted about 24 hours because basically Assad said, I'm not going anywhere. And part of the reason Assad has been so dug in is because uh, some of you who follow Syria know Syrian history. You know, his father um, destroyed uh, a city that was a hotbed of opposition to his rule. And I mean, literally massacred more than 10,000 people and almost seeded the ground so that nothing would ever grow there again. That very dramatic, but that was the impact it was meant to have. And so the people around Assad, who was never the person that was expected to succeed his father, that was a, an older brother who you know, was viewed as a much tougher, character. Uh, Bashar was off in London practicing ophthalmology, and so his brother gets killed in a car wreck. He gets summoned home, and he basically is given the responsibility of becoming the dictator of Syria. So why do I tell you all this? Because it matters if you know a little bit more about what is going on in the minds of those who are your adversaries. He is absolutely a prisoner of his family's expectations, his dead father's looming presence, and his delusion that I believe he now probably could pass a lie detector about, that everybody who opposes him is a terrorist, that's how Putin thinks, and Putin has basically you know, weighed in, particularly with uh, air power, uh, to support uh, this fight to the death policy that Assad has. And I, you know, look, I, I think that we've got to try to change the dynamic. And all through the campaign, you know, I would say I'm for a no-fly zone. And immediately, whether it was in the primary or in the general election, I'd be asked, well, no, aren't you afraid of the Russians? It's time the Russians were afraid of us because we were going to stand up for the rights, the human rights, the dignity, and the future of the Syrian people. And I actually had a lot of confidence that I could say to Putin and his team, look, you're either with us or against us on this no-fly zone. Here's what we're going to do. We don't want any confrontation with you, but we cannot let this massacre continue and the consequences that are affecting the entire region. So I, I feel pretty strongly about where we are now and what happened uh, uh, in these last days with a neuro neurotoxin, probably sarin gas is just... Let me say one more thing about this because there will be people who say, well, it's not our fight. We don't care. What difference does it make? We're not involved. First of all, we are in an interconnected, interdependent world, unlike any we've been in in history before, because of mobility, because of communications. And so what happens in other places can very much have an impact on you. But the world took a position. The world took a position after the First World War, whose 100th anniversary of starting we will be celebrating or commemorating, not celebrating. And we took a stand against the use of chemical weapons. We have a whole unit uh, attached to the United Nations that is devoted to trying to prevent chemical weapons from falling into the wrong hands from being used. It is important that we take a strong stand against chemical weapons. And we thought, you know, with the deal that uh, uh, the Obama administration uh, negotiated, that we'd gotten rid of, you know, their stocks. But 
Who knows whether they'd hidden some or whether they bought more, we don't know. Uh, we just know the impact. And so it is in our interest. We've got to start once again recognizing norms of behavior in our own country and globally are just as important to keeping peace and preventing atrocities as any law that is written down. People have to know that they will be held accountable as war criminals, as committing crimes against humanity if they engage in these kinds of aggressive, violent acts. We are about out of time, but let me ask just one last question about your future. So aside <laughs> from the book, um, will you run for office again? Mm -hmm. will, we, will, you, <laughs> will you ever be mayor, Clinton? Uh, <laughs> You know, you went, uh, the uh, UNICEF uh, uh, direct, executive directorship comes up, would you? I, I, you know, Nick, the, the short answer is I am really focused on, uh, you know, just doing some things that I think I can help make a difference with, um, like the supporting of young people and getting more women into politics. And I very much want to help Democrats take back the Congress and... Uh, <laughs> I, 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 have, I have no plans. I have no plans at all other than, you know, trying to find some interesting things to do, trying to support other people, uh, to pursue their interests, spend time with my grandchildren, which is a great, uh, uh, a great joy. So, you know, I'm just, I'm not, I, I'm not making any plans to do anything. That sound, does not sound like a very definitive refusal ever to think again in well, public office. you know, you know, I, I am looking at doing interesting things. I don't think that will include ever running for office again, uh, as interesting as I, I find that to be, because I think you can have a big influence. But I think there are lots of ways to make a difference, to work in, you know, all sectors uh, of our society, the, you know, the for-profit, the not-for-profit, uh, looking for ways that you can help people live their own lives better, tell their own stories better. And I've always been really focused on kids, and I want to find some good ways to help uh, organizations that are helping particularly kids that face difficulties in their lives, and I am passionate about uh, the unfinished business of the 21st century, the rights and uh, opportunities for women and girls, so I think there's a lot to do. <laughs> Well, thank you for this first interview since the election. <laughs> thank you for modeling a lifetime of public service. And thank you for joining Thank you to <laughs> all of you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Hey. Yay, there you are, Yay. my dear. Fantastic. Uh, On fire. It was really great. <laughs> thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. Wow. Wow. So, um, this is, I want to thank so much Secretary Clinton, not just for tonight and for giving women in the world the great honor of her first real interview. <laughs> <laughs> but I also, I want to just thank her for her many decades of service to this country, for everything she's done for America. And yes, 68 million people did vote for you, Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, your voice, your, you know, your brilliant mind, your amazing voice, your incredible patriotism need to still be out there big time because we need your leadership, we need your voice still. It's always going to be important, really. Um, and thank you so much, Nick Christoph, who for your wisdom and your rigor and the brilliant columns that you write, which, you know, keep the conscience of the world alive. Um, and thanks to all of you and Women in the World for coming today and to all the incredible, amazing participants we've had today. My God, the stage was on fire. So thank you all so much. Tomorrow morning, nine o'clock, day three begins. Yay. And thank you. So good. That was super. Oh my